some of the money you received from the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked me, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? And she said, yes, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And that moment she fell down at his feet and died. The young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You've seen the commercials for Holiday Inn Express where maybe someone is performing surgery and the person says, well, you're a very talented surgeon. And they said, oh, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, but I did stay at Holiday Inn Express last night. Or maybe the one where the person is disarming uh, a bomb or something, I think one of them is. And they said, oh, well, you're, you're a great engineer. And they said, oh, I'm not an engineer, but I did stay at Holiday Inn Express last night. Well, I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. And looking at this text, I kind of wish I would have because maybe that would have helped a little bit, because this is one of those texts that's just kind of hard to know what to do with. It's kind of hard to know what to say. And as many commentaries and as many uh, different sermons that I've listened to on it to try to get a little bit of a handle, I, I, I think either most people are like me, not quite sure what to do with it, or go what I consider a, a very off direction with it. I, I kind of feel like the time Douglas MacArthur was a student at West Point Military Academy, and he, he was given an assignment to make a presentation on Einstein's theory of relativity. And he'd studied the theory, but he says in his memoirs that it was complex and being unable to comprehend it, I just simply committed the pages to memory. And when I was called upon to recite it, I solemnly reeled off word for word what the book had said. And our instructor, Colonel uh, Feiberger, looked at me somewhat quizzically and asked, do you understand this theory? It was a bad moment for me, <laughs> but I did not hesitate in replying, no, sir. You could have heard a pin drop. I braced myself and waited, and then the slow words from the professor Neither do I, Mr. MacArthur, so what you've said sounds fine to me. I kind of feel that way about this text. And, and honestly, I could have skipped this text. I, I'm not doing an exhaustive study of the book of Acts. We're looking at scriptures about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And, and there's not a lot of Holy Spirit here, at least it appears on the surface. There is more when we really start to look. But I would have been justified in just saying, ah, I'm going to skip this one because it's difficult. And a lot of the difficulties of this text are never really answered. There's a lot that's not said in this text. Like why they held back. Why they lied. Why they weren't given the opportunity to repent. Exactly how was it that they died? Was it God striking them down? Did they simply have a heart attack because they got busted? What, what, what's the deal? There's a lot not answered. There's a lot of gray area. And as a result, the sermons that we typically hear from this text are topical sermons on stewardship or lying or greed. And, and I guess I'm not typical because I just don't see those as subjects that come from this text. And, and I think we can find some answers to some of these gray areas if we will decipher this text using the nature of God and a little bit of common sense. 
And although maybe I didn't see it at first when I was preparing this week and really thinking about just skipping this text, it certainly does apply to our overall theme of unleashed. So let's just begin by trying to answer some questions. Before we really get into the sermon, let's just try to answer some questions. Like, why did they deceive? Why the attempt to be misleading in the first place? I mean, they were being generous. They were attempting to help those in need. They were doing a great thing. And I would like to think that they began this process of, of selling their land with the best of intentions. I mean, think about it for a minute. How many of us can say that we've ever sold anything, an asset, an expensive asset, for the specific purpose of doing the work of the Lord? Even part of it. So what they were doing was a good thing. So why the deception? Well, maybe it was fear. Maybe they thought to themselves, well, we sold our land, and maybe we're going to need some of this money. But that's still not a reasonable excuse. They, they, they could have just been straight up about it. They, they could have been honest and just said, Peter, we sold this land, and here's 40% of the proceeds. Here's 50% of the proceeds. Zacchaeus gave Jesus 50% of his proceeds. That seemed fair to Jesus. They could have just said, this is half. Matter of fact, Peter even kind of calls him on that. He says in verse 4, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, Peter, you didn't have to lie about this. You could have said, we sold our land, and here's 25% of the proceeds, or here's 50% of the proceeds, or even here's 10% of the proceeds. So fear isn't really maybe a good reason. Could it have been that they got caught up in what everyone else would think? Could it be the impact of the gift that Barnabas had made and maybe some others had made had an impact on them and they wanted to make sure that everyone was going to think a certain way about them? In other words, could it have been about image? We are well-to-do. We're just as generous and just as great as Barnabas is. You can call me encourager too. We sold this land. It's no big deal. We'll never miss it. I think something important to remember when we study this text is giving in the first century was not the privatized act we have made it in the church today. People would see what was being placed at the feet of the apostles. They would see who was, and they would see who wasn't, and they would have to be open with one another about why they were giving what they were giving if it maybe didn't seem like enough. Whatever the reason, God took this very seriously. God took it very seriously. And then, and, but, but we look at this and we say, okay, so they lied about how much they were giving. We, we assume that Ananias did. We know that Sapphira did. That they lied about the amount they were giving. But why death? I mean, seriously, isn't God a God of grace? Isn't God a God who wants all men to repent? Then why not give them a chance? Why, why simply strike them dead? Well, here's the first thing I want you to note. The text never says that God killed Ananias and Sapphira. It simply says that they fell down and died. But, it just seems like God must have had something to do with it. I mean, it, it does. And as much as we don't like that, and as uncomfortable as that makes us, it just seems like he had something to do with it. I don't think we can escape that. So why? Why? Why would he do this? Why would they fall down and die? I think the passage makes more sense in the light of the end of chapter 4, which Andrew read just a little bit ago, where everyone was selling their possessions, laying it at the feet of the apostles. Barnabas lays everything at the feet of the apostles. You see, I think this story 
is a story of protection. It's a story of protection of that beautiful community that we call the church that was just beginning to spring forth into the world. There's one thing we all know and understand, and that is God cares deeply for the church that he created. Amen? He cares for the church. And the actions of Ananias and Sapphira were much more serious than just personal sin. Their lie affected the community. And that's the reason for such a harsh ending. Think about it this way. What if God viewed this early church as his baby? This is the church in its infancy. This is God's baby church. He's nurturing this church. He's caring for this church. Just like a father or a mother would care for an infant child. And suddenly, this type of Phariseeism, that's what it is. The very same thing that killed his son is now rearing its ugly head against the church. This, this Phariseeism that's all about looking good on the outside while being full of dead men's bones on the inside. This Phariseeism rears its head against his baby church. What if such a swift and violent act is simply the move of a father caring for his baby, for his infant? simply not allowing a bad seed to be planted in such a young and fruitful garden. You know what Ananias and Sapphira's problem was? Yes, it was lying. Yes, it was deception. But it goes deeper than that. Their problem was in not being real. Their problem was not being authentic with their brethren. So this lesson goes deeper for greed and deception for us. It goes right to the core of being real and genuine Christians. So everything I've said up to this point is possibly the longest introduction I've ever done in the history of my preaching. But I just wanted to set the stage for what we're looking at here. And I want us to talk about just being real with one another. Notice what it says in verse 11. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This narrative that we've read this morning, that we're studying this morning, it should still strike fear into the heart of Christians. It really should. It's okay for us to be scared every now and then. It's okay for a scripture to make us uncomfortable. It's okay that this is not at the top of our list of favorite Bible stories. Matter of fact, if I said, Mike, what's your favorite Bible story? And he said, Ananias and Sapphira, I might ask Mike to go to another church because it's just not our favorites. It's just, I wouldn't do that. It's just not our favorites. It's not, it's not something we enjoy reading. When I was reading that this morning and it said Ananias fell, Ananias fell down dead, how many of you went, oh, this is great? We don't like it. It's uncomfortable. And that's okay. It's supposed to be scary. Because Christians today still struggle with this. We struggle with being real with one another. We struggle with being genuine and authentic with our brethren, let alone the world. I mean, it's kind of like the old question, is the church a country club or is it a hospital? And, and I think most of us would answer that. Well, it's a hospital. It's where we go and it's where we're sick. Well, you don't put on a show in the hospital. You don't put on airs in the hospital. If the doctor comes in and you're there in that very becoming gown and, 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 and he says, how are you feeling? And you feel awful. You don't say, man, I'm great. I'm just doing awesome. Wonderful. Great. Good to see you. 
No. You're open. You say, I hurt here. I hurt here. I hurt there. Please fix me. Isn't that what the church is? Trey, I hurt here. I need you to help fix me. Phil, I hurt here. I need you to help fix me. Ananias and Sapphira should, should have said, we're giving all we can, but we're hurting. And we need you to help fix us. It's about being open and authentic and genuine with one another. Because even if we don't know what's going on behind the mask, God does. David understood that in Psalm 131, when, 139, when he said, Oh Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and you know when I stand up. You know my innermost thoughts. Matter of fact, before there's ever a word on my tongue, you know what I'm about to say. You know, Ananias and Sapphira, they could have just been up front. And I really feel like this Acts 4 church that we read about a couple of weeks ago, that's certainly a place they could have been open. It's a place they could have been honest. A little side note here. Don't we need to make sure that we're a church where people can feel comfortable being real and genuine and authentic? You know, I, I often ask people, why don't, you know, people will come up to me after a sermon and they'll say, well, I wanted to respond this morning, but I, but I just didn't. And, and I always ask, why? Why didn't you? You want to know the number one answer? I was afraid of what people might think. So if someone, I want everybody to look around in just a minute here. If you need to respond this morning, if someone responds this morning, how many of you are gonna judge them harshly for responding? Raise your hands. Look around, everybody. Look around. No hands are raised. So stop playing the fear card. Let's learn to be open and authentic with one another. Another lesson from this story that I really do think is a side lesson, but we would be remiss if we didn't at least talk about it for a minute. There is a warning here about Christians and the relationship with our material possessions. There is. Material possessions can be dangerous. Not wrong, just dangerous. See, Acts 4 paints such a beautiful picture of what we as Christians can accomplish when we're faithful stewards. And, and again, we need to remember that I think Ananias and Sapphira set out to do something good. Now, I'm not sure what the thought process was that led to the deception, but we all know how easy it is to get caught up in that kind of behavior where we attempt to be better than we are. You know, in today's society, we call it keeping up with the Joneses. In their case, it may have been keeping up with the Barnabases, but yet they, 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 they thought more about their possessions than they did about what they were really doing. That's why Paul later wrote in 1 Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and the many foolish and harmful uh, desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves for many, with many griefs. Well, what's the point? With Ananias and Sapphira, they had a dependency on earthly treasure rather than a dependency on the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the key reason that this scenario plays out in the first place. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6 that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That you can't serve to masters. This is a difficult story. I understand that. 
There's, there's so many unknowns in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. There's so many unanswered questions, so many unanswered whys. But there is one thing, whether we look at all this other stuff we've looked at so far and think, well, I don't know about that, I'm not sure about this, there's, there's still unanswered questions here. There's one thing we can know about this text, and that is that God desires for us to be real with him and with each other. God wants us to be real. The sin in today's lesson wasn't that Ananias and Sapphira didn't give everything. It's not about stewardship. It was the lie. This lesson is about hypocrisy. This lesson is about trying to act like something that you're really not. It's about trying to put one over on the brethren. It's about trying to put one over on God. God calls us to be real. To let people know who we really are. Phariseeism and hypocrisy. That's something Jesus warned about from the very beginning of his ministry. So it should not be surprising that the Holy Spirit dealt with it swiftly when it reared its ugly head in the infancy of the church. What's this lesson about this morning? It's about being real with one another. And it's about being real with God. So the most important question I can ask you this morning as we start to wrap things up is, are you real? Now, I I mean, I know you're here. I know you sang the songs this morning. But are you real? And, 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 And don't misunderstand. I'm not asking you, are you maliciously trying to fool people? No, no, no. I don't, I don't mean that. I don't think there's anyone here that's maliciously trying to fool people. But are you just being genuine about your hurts and about your concerns and about your struggles? Are you putting on airs? Are you acting like something you're not? Let me give you a little test. I mentioned this earlier, but I want to get personal for a minute. Perhaps at some point, you have been moved by a sermon. But you avoided stepping out and walking to the front, fearing what people might think of you for doing so, not daring to show weakness. I once had an elder say to me that I just, I don't feel comfortable responding because I'm an elder, and I don't want people to think that I'm not fit to be an elder because I had to respond. And we talked a long time about it, and about four weeks later, he responded. And he showed his authenticity and that he was human. If you've been in that place where you feel like you just don't want to show that weakness, you don't want people to see that side of you, then I'm going to say this as lovingly as I know how to say it. It's really the same issue that Ananias and Sapphira had. More concern over what others might think than being real with God and real with your brethren. God is calling us to authentic Christianity. That's what our small groups are about. That's why we do small groups here is so we can practice authentic Christianity to be a community where we can drop the veneer and be real with one another and lean on each other and admit mistakes without the fear of forever being branded in some way for our negative actions. God's calling us to lay not just our gifts, church, but our lives at his feet. Have you noticed that in this text and even throughout the Gospels, there's an interesting emphasis on laying things at people's feet. The people selling their homes lay the money at the apostles' feet. 
Barnabas laid his money at the apostles' feet. Ananias and Sapphira laid their portion at the apostles' feet. Even when we go back into the Gospels, the woman with the alabaster jar anoints Jesus' feet. And when Ananias and Sapphira die, they lay down at the apostles' feet. Laying something at their feet is supposed to represent fully surrendering themselves to the will of God and the good of the church. So when Ananias and Sapphira claim to lay everything down and surrender to God and the church, God makes them honest by laying them down at the feet of the apostles. So what's my point? Eventually, everything will be laid at the feet of Jesus. Everything. So we can either willingly and genuinely surrender ourselves to the will of God in the church, or we are told that there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I told you this wasn't going to be a fun sermon today. And it wasn't going to be an enjoyable reading. But it leaves us with the question, what do you need to lay at the feet of Jesus today? What is there that you need to just let go of and be real about? You know, the reason I chose not to skip this text, even though I really tried to talk myself into it, the reason I chose not to skip this text is because unless we are real, we can never be unleashed. The Holy Spirit can never use us to our fullest potential until we allow Him to reign in our lives, until we take our gifts, we take our desires, we take our selfishness, and we lay it all at the feet of Jesus. You know, this really isn't such a scary story when we realize that the moral of this story is that God loves His church and that you are in His church, which means that God loves you. And he is willing to go to extreme measures to protect your precious faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us be real. Because we know that, Father, with all the good works that we do, with all the gifts that we lay at your feet, with all the children that we served last week, with all the Thanksgiving baskets that we'll be giving away in the next few weeks, that, Father, all of those will really amount to nothing more than busy work unless we are open and real and genuine and authentic with one another and with you. Father, because we know when we become open and real that we leave room for your Holy Spirit to work in our lives and work in this church. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for loving your church so much that you would do whatever it takes to preserve our faith, even if it means allowing your son to go to Calvary on our behalf. Father, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So the invitation this morning is simple. If you're wearing a mask, Take it off. That's it. If you're subject, why don't you come? Always stand and sing.